hello everyone. It's me, Ari Dossett, or just call me Rashid, perfectly fine. I'm here with another live. And first, let me know if you can hear me clearly, please. Quite important. And let me see if you can see me clearly on here. Okay, need to pull this up a little bit more. Let me see if this goes well over there. Hold on. Can you all hear me clearly? Let me know in the live chat, please. Thank you very much. Okay, you can hear me clearly? Okay, that's good. So let's continue with the live stream. How many of you heard of the founding myth of Rome? Let me know. The founding myth of Rome. How many of you heard of it before? Let me know in the live chat. Say I do if you uh, have heard of it. Have you ever heard of the founding myth of Rome? Let me know in the live chat. Oh, let me see. Curly Girl is here. Shoshan is here. Edward's here. Blue Angel. Sherry. Hi, Sherry. Joanna is here. I'm glad you're all here. Have you ever heard of the founding myth of Rome? If you didn't, it's not a problem. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain it to you here in shortly. But I'm just, I'm just curious about uh, the level of knowledge is here. Okay, hold on. Have you ever heard of the founding myth of Rome? I'm just writing down. You know what? Maybe this one is bad. This is wrong. The founding myth. Okay, let me see. Hold on. By the way, if you all can hear me clearly, I asked you a question. Have you heard of the founding myth of Rome before? Let me know in the live chat, please. Let me know. I'll make some notes and I'll come back. Let me see. Okay. Now, Andy, is this Wolf Brother story? I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you the myth very quickly, as it has been told from generation on generation, and how you appeared in high school, and then I'll give you the true anthropological explanation of what what really happened. Okay. So. First is how they tell it in high school. There was a twin brother. The twin brother was abandoned by their parents. The twin brother were found by a female wolf. And the female wolf adopted the two brothers. So the two human brothers, as babies, they sucked at the breast of the female wolf. So they grew up with wolves. But eventually, it was obvious the two brothers are human beings, not wolves. So they couldn't match well uh, with uh, the wolf clan. So they grew up. Miraculously, they could function as humans even though wolves raised them. So they were raised by wolves. They became adults. And as adults, they wanted their own city for some reason. OK. So Romulus, Romulus and Remus, to the twin brother, they had a disagreement where to build their new city. There was one hill over there, and there was another hill over here. But eventually they decided, you know what, Remus, you built your thing over there, I built my thing over here. However, there was some ambiguity in the agreement, because Romulus uh, marked a, a territory that Ramos did not agree with. Because Ramos was saying, hold on a minute, but the way you mark this territory is at my expense. So Ramos challenged the claim of his brother. And guess what? Either the brother himself or one of the servants of the brother, because even people supported them, killed Ramos. 
And after killing Remus, he built this city called Roma, or in English, Rome. That's how we tell it in high school. Okay, this I can read it in the textbooks also. Okay. However, we all know this story is nonsense. Listen, if you leave a human baby, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about a two-year-old, I'm talking about a human baby. If you're born a, a baby amongst wolves, listen, the baby is eaten. Or if the baby even survives, it will survive for maybe like maybe a few weeks or whatever, the baby dies. Wolves, those animals cannot raise a human baby. So the whole idea that two people are born in a twin, wolves raise them, and now they turn out speaking human language with the intelligence to build the city, everyone knows this, that's symbolic. It can't be literal, okay? There are a few elements in the story I've highlighted over here. The first thing is the abandonment. The myth. Yes, I'm decoding the founding myth of Rome right now, okay? They have the abandonment. Then you have the The deny, the denial. Then you have the escalation. Then you have the murder. And then you have the civilization. And I'm going to explain each of these phases to you. Okay? But first thing first, one thing you need to understand Roma. That's how you say Rome in, in Latin and also in ancient Greece. I believe Roma or Rome was a Greek colony. The ancient Greeks had their city states in, in the Greek peninsula and what they call Turkey also. And those Greek city states would, would, would build colonies, small settlements across the Mediterranean and also the rest of Europe. So a colony of an ancient Greek city was an extension of that city abroad. And Roma began as a Greek colony. So the Roman people were Greeks that mixed with foreigners and the locals. Okay? So the people of Rome were not, were not, were not European whites. They weren't. The elite that governed Rome were white Greeks, but the public was a mixed population. Okay? It was a mixed Greek population. That's what Rome was, how it began. It began as a colony. However, the colony was abandoned. It's not even clear which of the Greek city-states established was Athens, Sparta, uh, Thessalonica, or Ephesians. Ephesians. We don't know which Greek city-state established Rome. Anyway, whatever, whatever Greek community established the colony abandoned it. Okay, so let's go, let's go deep into this. So, yet, yet this. Greek colony at the Tiber, the Tiber River, it was abandoned by its colonizers. So what happens? The local population that's there, they're abundant. They can be robbed, they can be looted, they can be enslaved, anybody can help with them, they're abundant. So what happens? When the public is abundant, they tend to look, look who's to blame, why are we abundant? Then they turn on one another. So you have, so you have all this conflict going on. And at some point, one individual pops up and says, hey, hold on, we, don't, we can't continue like this. I have a solution for this. They are to blame, we have to continue further. Well, that's what happened with the Greek colony in Rome. But you're not going, but what, when, when, what the thing is, Roma was never meant to be a world, a seat of world power. It never was. So when Roma was selected in 27 BC, as the world capital, because the Greek world had Greek kingdoms in Central Asia, yet several, yet the Seleucid Empire, the Ptolemaic Empire, yet uh, two other and less small empires of here, yet the Roman Republic. So the Greek world had all these fractions here and there. And Julius Caesar, or we call Julius Caesar, he wanted to restore the Greek world. By expanding the Roman the Roman Republic into what they call fronts. Julius Caesar was murdered, as we all know. Later, his nephew, I believe it was, Gaius, 
Octavianus, which we call Caesar Augustus, he finished the job by unifying uh, the Greek dynasties under one rule in Rome, and that was the Roman Empire. So Rome was never built to be a world power. Rome was just an abundant Greek colony. We had a mixed Greek population. That's all Rome was. And Rome at some point had, they, didn't have, they didn't have a king. They only had a, a, a court of older men in business called the senators that regulated things. And the Republic was always a big drama, big failure. Okay, it was, it was always uh, issues here and there. So Rome was an abundant Greek colony that for centuries was, was, was without any leadership. And now after about 500 years, they finally had leadership again. They don't call it a king because they have this issue with kingship. So he became the Augustus or Kaiser, the, what do they call emperor? Similar to what the Chinese had or, or in Asia. So how are you going to justify Rome dominating the world if Rome had no glorious beginning? So what you do is you are not going to tell the people the real reality, the full reality of how Rome began. You're going to show the reality to them. There's a difference between telling and showing. Okay, let's say Kevin's wife is cheating on him. And we saw her cheating on him. And we took pictures of her kissing the other man. And we took pictures of her going to the motel with the other guy. Let's say I would call Kevin say, hey, Kevin, uh, I have news you, man. Your wife is cheating on you. I'm telling Kevin. When I tell Kevin, is it proven without a doubt that she's cheating? No, I just told him. It can be that I, that I hit, that I'm wrong about it, I, that it wasn't like that. So it can be that I'm mistaken. So me telling uh, Kevin, your wife is cheating, doesn't automatically mean she is cheating. But if I don't say anything, where I sent on was a picture of her, his wife kissing another man and also going to another hotel room, in that case, I've shown that she's cheating. In that case, there is no court case, no debate, anything. The proof is shown. So that's the difference between telling and showing. One thing you need to understand, in this world, they don't tell you everything, but they show you everything. So those founding myths out there are ways to show you the reality of what happens, but they don't tell you explicitly what happened. They don't have to tell you and have shown you. If Kevin's wife is cheating on him and I sent them the pictures of her kissing this other man and entered the hotel room, that is proof. I just sent him on WhatsApp and I don't have to say anything. Why should I say anything? It's not necessary. The proof is there. So understand the world shows you what goes on, but they don't tell you. Because once you show someone, you don't have to tell them because what you've shown is more than enough. So do you understand that between telling and showing? Do you understand the difference between telling and showing and why the world shows you? Do you understand that? Let me know the live chat now. Let me know. Don't worry, I want to know, I know for sure if you understand this before I continue with the next part. Because it's very important to understand this. Okay, you understand? Okay, that's good. So let's go back to the founding myth of Rome. Okay? You have a twin, so siblings who have been abandoned. So that's the abandonment. The abandonment really happened because there was a Greek population that was mixed, that was abandoned by their mother city. It happened. And there were children, including babies, in danger because of it. No ice cream here, please. See what I mean? So, the abandonment. And then wolves raised the two, two children. Hold on a minute. A wolf is symbolic for predators or bad people. So, indeed, in history, when, I don't know whether it was Athens or Sparta, whatever, when the mother city decided to abandon Roma, for some reason, it was too expensive or whatever. The public had all these robbers, all these sociopaths, all these bad people come take advantage of them. There were even bad people amongst them saying, hey, there's no government over here. Nobody has to leave, so I, we can do whatever we want. So wolves raised the boys simply means the community was not prey to predators. 
So the, so the boys grow up. What happens? How come wolves raise you and then you suddenly talk like a human? So there's denial. People don't admit what happens. But what they're denying will eventually lead to conflict because something bad goes on. I mean, they've been abundant and nobody wants to talk about it. So eventually it's a conflict. In the conflict, they end up taking it out on the victors. And to the east, the public got, but they not on the victims, they now celebrate by justifying why they killed the individual. And to maintain the east they got, they built what we call their culture on it. That is the founding murder of Rome. So it's not so that, so Rome, Rome, Romulus and Remus may have been real human males that existed, maybe. But likely, Romulus and Remus never existed. They're just, they're just symbolic for the for how Roma survived being abundant by their home city, uh, their, their mother city. You get me? So when they tell you the founding of Rome and all that, you know already no child was raised by wolves. But you can understand that a wolf is involved for conning people. So you they show you with this myth that Rome had a horrible beginning. So they don't have to explain and tell you specifically what happens. You get me? That's how founding myths are. Now, understand the following. Founding myths are common, okay? Now, in the case of Rome, they make up a symbolic story of two brothers being raised by wolves, other bands of one of them. But in some cases, they don't come with a symbolic story. In some cases, they use actual historical facts. Let's think about Julius Caesar, okay? Julius Caesar, this general who became dictator in Rome for a while, he became the scapegoat. He said, we need to protect the Gauls and we need to include Gaul into Gaul was ancient France into the Roman Republic. So we did. A lot of people in Italy not agree with it. So there were tensions, there was tension in, in Italy. Italy wasn't even a unified country back then yet. So in the Roman Republic, people turned on Julius Caesar. And he was murdered eventually. This was a big embarrassment. And to cover up this embarrassment, his, I believe it was adopted nephew anyway, the other Caesar, uh, Gaius Octavius, which was called Caesar afterwards, he now harmonized everything by, by using the murder of his uncle as a founding myth for to make Rome the, the governing city of the world. So I mean, so in this case, it's different than this founding myth over here. In this case, you have an escalation in the community. They took it out on someone, as you see over here, they took it out, and then they built a culture around it. And that's why Emperor Augustus is the first Roman emperor. And that's why so many rulers late in history borrowed the title Caesar because it was quite effective. Okay? And Gaius Octavianus, which we call Augustus, I talked about him before in a uh, last about the wedlock that he came up with. He was not such a big hero, none of that. He was actually a faker, but he knew the psychology of the mess. All right? Now, I'm going to erase this right now because um, we don't really need this anymore. I'm going to the United States right now. The United States also has a founding myth, okay? I'm going to there right now. So just bear with me over here, okay? Let's look at Scotia. It's kind of the northern shores of the United States. Hold on, let me create a mix. Okay. In the 1600s, there were migrants lost refugees coming to America from the British Isles. All right, that happened. Somewhere in the mid 17th century, you had a Virginia company established in the United States. That's where you get the term Commonwealth Virginia from. Later, England, or in 1707 onwards, was Britain. Britain was uh, Scotland and England United. Well, 
by the way, uh, Wales was part of England anyway, incorporated. So from 1707, it was not Britain, not England anymore. So they had a few settlements here and there, which it turned into colonies. Okay. 1763, because most of the North America was run by the French as New France, Nouvelle France, I believe it was called. 1603, after a big war worldwide, um, Spain became dominant in North America and Britain got Canada. Britain got Canada. Plus, Indian land. Indian land was between the Mississippi River plus the 12 colonies, 12 British colonies, okay? So this is Mississippi right over here. It's another river over here. And I know it's not a full, full well map, but okay. So 763, uh, Britain got Florida and Canada, Florida from Spain, Canada from France. They also got the Illinois country over here which how the French called it. So this from Mississippi all the way to the 12 colonies, that was all Britain now. So 1763 was the beginning of the British Empire. All right. But it was a big problem in this British Empire. Plus yet the Scottish people and the English people they were all called, both called British people because Ireland was still a separate kingdom, even though they had the same king of, uh, as England. But the problem is the Scottish did not want to be part of this British kingdom. So the Scottish wanted to be part of it because they felt oppressed. And to some extent they were oppressed by the English. So, uh, the Scottish would want to want to get out. But the issue is, Britain now had an empire. They also had islands in the Caribbean and all of that. So now, Britain had to make their empire work. So now, the British Empire had place in India, it had places in Africa, had place in, I believe, in the Caribbean also. Belize was also a part of Britain, Jamaica, the Bahamas. So the British Empire was an empire already, 1763. Problem was this the this, this division of Scotch and the English. Now, in North America, you had the 12 colonies. And the 12 colonies were actually provinces. So they were actually, because Britain itself had no provinces, but the empire had provinces, it was a weird situation. But anyway, the provinces were seen as an extension of Britain itself. That's how it was governed. So the British parliament made legislation and the governors implemented them locally. And, but the problem is, there was one big problem with the situation in the late 1760s. The economy in the 12 colonies was not sustainable because they had to uh, maintain the roads, they had to maintain the buildings, and because there was a population increase, they had to build new towns also, they had to renew contracts with the Native American kings also. There was a slavery going on because in Britain, nobody wanted slavery around. So they wanted to abolish slavery all over the British Empire, but then yet in North America, a lot of slave owners saying, we don't want slavery to go. So it was, so it was just not sustainable. So at some point, Remember, Britain was also in the 1770s expanding in Australia and New Zealand. And they were also growing in India with the British East India Company. Okay? So Britain was growing, was one and one to expand into Australia and New Zealand. And they were also increasing India. And they also had to maintain the 12 colonies. And they also had to maintain Canada and Jamaica and Bahamas and Belize and some other Caribbean islands. So at some point, it became obvious that we cannot do this. It's too much for us. And don't forget the Scottish want to leave. So 
What do you do then? What do you do then? You have to lose. Either you stop Australia and New Zealand, which would have been more obvious because Australia was really expensive for the British to go there, sort of penal colony over there. So why would you why would you do that? And it was so far away also. And so giving up Australia and New Zealand wasn't a logical option, but they wanted to hold on to Australia and New Zealand for some reason. Okay, you want to hold on to Australia and New Zealand. Okay, are you gonna let go of India then? Or, or are you gonna give back Jamaica to Spain? Are you going to give up Belize and Jamaica to Spain then? Or are you give up the Bahamas? They had to give up something because they didn't have enough manpower in the military, nor enough finances, nor enough in or good organization to, to all of this. They had to do something. But hey, think about it. They just got their empire in 1763. If by late 1777, if, if in the mid 1770s, like if 10 years later, they say, sorry, we had an empire 10 years ago, but we need to give up some of it. The Scotch will say, you see, that's why this union, union called Britain, it, 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 it's a, it, we should be part of it. England forced this union, uniting us with them. We didn't want it. And now we're part of the empire, it doesn't even work. Oh, and don't forget, the war in 1763, it emptied the treasury of Britain. So the locals, both in North America and Britain, had to pay higher taxes. So the Scottish people think, hold on a minute, you guys got Canada, fine for you, why do you have to pay for it? And now you have to let go of part of your empire? It would be a big failure for Britain. So what happened? You had Freemasons in the United States who came together and some of them joined this movement because there were conflicts in the British colonies, of course, taxes, or there were even riots going on in the 12 colonies. Eventually, they came with this Public, they published this document called Declaration of Independence. And they came up with the flag, the Grand Union flag. The Grand Union flag was the same flag of the British East India Company, but with a little adaption to it. Okay? So they wanted to become a self governing colony, just like the British, uh, similar to the British East India Company had its own government. Well, long story short, eventually, Britain conceded and gave them the self-government, but there were conditions to it in the Treaty of Paris. The Treaty of Paris was in, in 1776 was the Declaration of Independence, 17, was 83, yeah, 1783, in the Treaty of Paris, and in 1794, we had the J Treaty that confirms the Treaty of Paris, okay? Amen. You can read those treaties yourself. Problem is, a lot of the British people in North America never want this independence thing. Because now you have this thing called the United States that didn't even have a constitution yet. The constitution came in the 1788. How come you declare independence in 1776 and it takes you over, third, over 12 years to come up with a constitution on the govern the country? What the heck? So, based on this, you have to conclude that the Brit that Britain abundant a portion of the colonies because they couldn't keep the empire going, keeping everything. They had to do something, but they didn't want to actually just abandon it. They wanted to have an excuse to abandon it. An excuse was all the rights ever over there, the riots. And then came the Declaration of Independence, so then came the excuse, oh, we're going to abandon that place. They stayed in Canada. They stayed in, numbers, uh, in other place, in place over there, and yet enough British men there in Canada to shut all those rights down, so why didn't they do it? because the British Empire needed to do something. But what are you going to tell later generations of the United States of America? That they are a nation abandoned by the, the motherland, but they're still exploited by the motherland through, through the banking system? They're not going to say that. You need to give them a reason to be proud of the country. That's why you had the founding fathers of the United States. Just like the founding myth of Rome, you had the founding fathers. They use historical events, give them a little twist how they tell it, and make, make up the American Revolution of 1776. And that became the story to justify the existence of the United States of America. Is this all clear to you? Let me know in the live chat. Well done. Is 
there's no clear unto you. So, just like with ancient Rome, there was a bombing that happened, which was to torment the public. The trauma led to denial. People didn't really want to admit, you know, what the model led upon it. King George really just let this thing happen. Then it came, it came a fight. And out of this fight, and all the victims came out of it, you laid their hats, this flag, the, the, this new flag, the Betsy Rose flag, which later means we are a nation, United States of America. And over time, in the 19th century, they solidified this myth of the American Revolution to make sure the public that lived within the physical United States would think that the country had a noble start, a noble cause. That's what happened. So that's another uh, founding myth. But here is a problem with it. It is the American public of the later generations born in the United States that were, that were taught this in high school or, in, or, or, in, or, in, or by the parents or by the church. They're the ones that lead this American revolution. They don't want to believe the American Revolution because they don't know any better. That's what they were taught. But here's the issue. Nowhere else in the world did people believe in the American Revolution. Yes, listen, when I was a, when I was a kid and I, we, we got history lesson, we were taught about America fighting against Britain for taxes that became independent. We were very vague about it. But that story, even as a kid hearing it, I was thinking, first of all, we're in the Netherlands. Why are we getting history of this country, United States? Please, as if it's a great accomplishment. And hold on a minute. You fight because of taxes, but you also put taxes when you put off your independence. So even as a kid, I'll say this story is, is it's just nonsense. It just doesn't end up. What I'm saying is more people, more pupils thought about this, but hey, because we want to get a good grade on the test, we just write down on the test what uh, we were taught in the in textbook. But let me tell you, outside the United States, nobody ever believed in the American Revolution. Now, in the 1940s, after the defeat of Nazi, after the shutdown of Nazi Germany, nobody wanted the British Empire around anymore because the British Empire failed in keeping the Nazis in check. So from that point on, the British Empire came to collapse and the British bankers and the others, they re relocated their financial assets to the United States. And from that point on, the United States became a superpower and Hollywood generated this militarized culture called American culture. They emphasize this dialect called American English, and that's what we have today. So American English, as well as what we call American culture, are militarized, simulated cultures generated by Hollywood on behalf of British bankers who relocate their assets to the United States to continue uh, their dominance. And that's how American and quote unquote superpower. So many of those military bases America has right now they continue to do what the British did. But instead of the British being everywhere, now it's the Americans doing it. You get me? So, nobody really believes in the American Revolution. Now, there are people who migrated to the United States and thought, hmm, I want to be part of this great nation. And they just fell into the American Revolution. But generally, Japanese people, Koreans, uh, Indonesians, people from Africa, people from Latin America, they all know deep down inside there was no American Revolution. But to be polite and not cause any people's hurt feelings, we just get along. Oh, Washington was a great hero. 1776, American independence, the American spirit. There was never an American Revolution. It never happened. Oh, and by the way, the Yankee Doodle song. I don't know if I should play that song for you right now. Because maybe I'll get in trouble with YouTube uh, copyright, but you know what? Let me just let me just go to the Yankee Doodle song right now. Okay. I'm gonna leave the live chat for now. Let me just go to okay, hold on. I hope you'll hear it well. Oh, and by the way, if you're an American watching this, I'm not looking down on you. Okay, if you believe the American Revolution, you were indoctrinated to, to believe that. Okay, so you're not stupid. Okay, you're not. 
You were just brainwashed, okay? I'm telling you the facts now to undo the brainwashing, to undo the spell on you. That's what I'm doing here. Okay, I'm not just gonna, is there copyright on this? I don't believe there is. I'm just gonna play it, okay? As maximum. Okay. What's a macar what's a macaroni? You had those hats, those wigs, you had those wigs, I mean, that they used to wear in the 18th century. And yeah, so someone carrying a macaroni was seen as effeminate, okay? So it wasn't a very good thing. Why do you write on a pony? A pony is a small horse. If you're part of the military, you should write on horses, on stallions. I mean, male horses. Okay, let's continue. Captain Goodwin. Speak as his people Yankee Doodle. Yankee was a cuss word really for people, for British people born in North America. A doodle was someone who could not really play music very well, but they kept playing on music and annoyed everyone. So, dude, so Yankee Doodle is not really a good term. By the way, this song was a mocking song made by the British military. It was stationed in, in North America. Why, when the country became independent, they take on the mocking song of the country they fought for? Doesn't add up. Just listen. Also, Mercury. I'm going to play the whole thing. Also, Mercury. There comes Captain Washington. Not General Washington. Captain Washington on a slapping stallion, so a strong horse. And there was this man, it must be a million. Were there one million people ready to fight over there? No. So, this whole song Yankee Doodle was a mocking song. The fact they adopted a mocking song as a national um, hymn almost, even till this day, the politicians are showing you that this thing here is mockery. But I dare to say a lot of Americans never really paid attention to Yankee Doodle or investigated the origin of the song, nor the symbolic words they're using in it. Because if they did, they would be hard by thinking, how the heck did we adopt such a song? Were no other musicians around were ready to compose new songs for the for new nation that they fought for? Nah. Look, let me go back to the live chat. Okay, it's over here. Nah. Look. So, so uh, understand this. They show you through the Yankee Doodle song, to a lot of those Hollywood movies, even they show you that the American Revolution was just mockery. They hint to you that you know what Britain really abandoned us. But we still the British bankers they uh, they can punish off us. The War of 1812. Many of you never heard of that war, I think. The Jay Treaty in 1794, it specified that his Britannic Majesty, the King of Great Britain, was conducting and directing the econom economy of the United States. It's written J Treaty in all the in all the articles. Read it yourself. I never hear people talk about the J Treaty. Okay, let me write it down. J Treaty. Okay? And guess what? The United States violated the J Treaty. And what happened? 
They got warnings from Britain. Eventually, 1812, the British, through Canada, they shut down the American government, confiscated Mandarin documents, and confiscated their money. They shut down the American government and shut down the whole United States financially and militarily. Britain did that. And later in 1812, they made peace with Britain and the United States continued. But a lot of Americans even know about this. They didn't even know about the War of 1812 or why it was even fought for. So mentioned very briefly, just look up War of 1812. Why? Because the United States started their own Navy and they joined uh, the Kingdom of Sweden in fighting pirates in the Mediterranean. Well, somewhere this violated the Jay Treaty, how America was acting economically. It wasn't in the interest of the British Empire, so Britain eventually, according to the Jay Treaty, shut them down. Okay? In Hand, I believe it was Treaty of Hand. In Treaty of Hand, they kind of restored the relationship. How many of you have heard of the War of 1812 and the, the, the Jay Treaty and the Treaty of Hand? How many of you heard of those three things before? Let me know in the live chat. Let me know. The Jay Treaty, the Treaty of Hand and the War of 1812. How many of you ever heard of those things before? Let me know. If you didn't, just say I didn't. Just want to check. If you have heard of it. So, if the, so the Jay Treaty was renovated in 1820 later on. So the Jay Treaty in Iraq is still in place. What does it say about the so-called independence of the United States of America? Just something for you to think about, not going into that right now. So in this case, you have a founding myth that's, that's continued still this day. And it's not about questioning it that America's in trouble. Okay? So let me re remove this. Hold on. All right. Now, why let's talk about founding myths. In a founding myth, Something bad was done to people. But you don't want to just tell what well, the bad thing happened because it's going to be quite embarrassing to tell it. So you show what happens, and it's up to the people to catch, catch, catch it. This is what you do in a founding myth. Now, founding myths don't only apply to nations or kingdoms or empires. A founding myth can also happen in a local community. Okay. When, okay, let's give an example, okay? Very briefly. Let's say this is you. Your name is Mark, okay? At age seven to age eight to eight to age nine, you are sexually molested by the child molester, okay? Let's say that's you. It happened in two years, two years time. Later, when you were 12 years old, the guy was arrested, okay, and went to prison. Now, question remains, is the problem solved now? Because a few years later, the pedophile was sentenced to prison. Let me know the life chain. Is the problem solved? Let me know. If you have this guy called Mark, when he was between ages seven and nine, he was sexual less than his child molester. It, it took over two years long. Eventually, a few years later, the guy was arrested, put in prison. Is the problem solved now? Let me know. Nope, at all. Why? The fact is, this child was neglected by the community. So the adults didn't pay attention to the child, didn't pay attention to the other adults around. Because listen, child molesters never just go out there and just jump on any child. They examine whether people look after a child or not. 
So the fact that this even happened means the child was neglected by the community. So the community has to both apologize and take proof. They have to. Because the thing is, if they neglected this child, it means they neglected other children too. So I made more interesting things are happening. So now the community has lost its credibility. So let's say now the guy goes to prison, okay? But Mark now is 17 years old and he's uh, addicted to drugs, okay? He's addicted to drugs and at age 19, he is killed by an overdose. And then suddenly they arrest a gang member who sold drugs to Mark. Okay, so Mark's emotional wounds were never dealt with. He was even blamed for acting out as a child, so he ended up addicted to drugs. And before he had got a chance to look for help, he died by overdose. So now they arrest a gang member who sold the drugs in neighborhoods. Is the problem solved now? Let me know the last chance. Is it solved now? No, it's not. The community is still the community is still is still neglectful. The community even blamed him for his bad behavior in his teenage years. You know, the bad behavior was a result of trauma the community did to him. He was taken advantage of by a drug dealer that ended up killing him. So now you offer the drug dealer, it's all the drug dealer's fault. And now the police arrest the guy, puts him in prison, and they say, yes, we're a great community. We deal with bad guys like him. So now you have two things. You have the, you have the community. The community that was at fault. And you have the victim that survived. The victim that survived would reveal the fault of the community. So the community does want to deal with its fault. So they wanted to exterminate the victim. So they enabled his drug addiction and the sale of drugs and eventually the victim was gone and now need to put the blame on another scapegoat just the drug dealer now the drug dealer is not innocent but okay they put all the blame on him and now the community hold on let me put it with another color the community is built out of its um, bad reputation. So the drug dealer becomes the bailout for the community. So everyone sees the community as a good community. These are good people, hardworking, they don't bother anyone. And this drug dealer was messing around, harming our children. So the police came, the police are the heroes, they arrested him, and I was in prison. That's a founding myth. In this case, Mark is the founding murder that keeps his good reputation going. So you would hear Mark died of an overdose because his drug dealer took advantage of him. So you now get upset the drug dealer and say, oh, what did they do with the drug dealer? Oh, they arrested him in prison. Yeah, you guys did the right thing. Community looks good. What they won't tell you is, is that the drug dealer would only take advantage of Mark because the community violated him by, by not looking after him. They won't tell you that, because that will reveal the fault of the community. So they come with a founding myth in which the actual victim's death is used as, is perceived as collateral, and they put the full blame on maybe a, on another a target who may have some blame in it. So even in modern day um, communities, they use founding myths to cover up what, re, what the community really did. And some of you were like this mark. I'm not saying you were sexually molested, no. Maybe you were not molested. I hope you were not. Nobody should have anyone. Many of you were like this mark over here. You were 
the neglected party that nobody wants, the F1 wants to go. But for them to actually lynch you, they can't do it because you have police forces today and courthouses. So they enable you in, in toxicity. They enable you with wrong decisions. They do all of that. So they can all blame it on you. Oh, well, Maria was killed by her ex-boyfriend. Well, you know what? She shouldn't be in a party girl, go party all the time. Oh, why didn't she listen to her parents to find a better man? Okay, but when Maria was dating all those men, weren't you guys supportive of her? Say, oh, girl, forget what I'm dating another guy. Weren't you guys supportive of it? Why don't you tell them, Maria, listen, you need to get your act together. Have no, you didn't do that. You enabled her to date the wrong man. No, eventually you come to a bad guy. Why? Because you sick of one of those bad guys to get rid of her. That's why. And now it happens. Now all of you are, have cried crocodile tears on a funeral. They all want the killer to go to prison. And so, so we are a good community. We avenge our people. Well, no, that's a founding murder right over there. Mm-hmm. Hold on. So, this is scapegoating when it succeeds. But there are times, thank God, there are quite some times when scapegoating fails. Let's say the community neglected you so they violate you by doing that, but you never fell for this, the, the, you never fell for the gaslighting that was all on you. You say, okay, it's partly on me because I make wrong decisions in life, but it's not all on me. You guys have a part too. Let's say you always emphasize you have three parts too. Eventually, it becomes unbelievable for them to continue to act like they have no part of it. Or let's say something bad happens, they try, try to cover up, it's not it spokes, it's on blocks everywhere. There are times scapegoating fails. What happens when scapegoating fails? The public goes silent about it. Completely silent. Why? Because scapegoating fails. Why does the public go completely silent? Because they know what they've done. Listen, if you're part of a gang and you're getting kidnapped and, and, and uh, sold some minors on sex, uh, to sex trafficking, you are a member of that gang. You didn't do it. You weren't even there when they were kidnapping those girls and selling them. But it's a problem. You can still be arrested for the your gang did because you're part of a movement that did harm to those little girls. So because you're part of that movement, you're also responsible for what the movement does. You're part of the movement. If the movement does harm, and you, know, you don't agree with it, leave the movement. As long as you're part of the movement, you are accountable and responsible for what the movement does. The same is with society. Even if you are just 20 years old and you're Parents and grandparents did this some harm in the community. You can say, but those were parents and grandparents of me. Okay, but if, if, you're, if you're still be part of that society, then you also participate in the blame and the consequences of what that society did. So that's how simple it is. What this a lot of people is, they don't want to admit such things because then you admit that they are blameworthy too for not wanting, wanting to rectify this. A lot of people say, well, it happened in the past. It's so long ago. Let's, we can't do anything about the past anymore. You just forget about it and move on. People that talk like that, they simply don't want to deal with justice. If a society you want to be part of, or that you insist being part of, is doing all this harm, you share in the blame, and you also now have to participate in complying with justice. If, if it costs you personally, that's reality. But people don't want to go there. They just want some third party to explode the bomb so F1 can be built out from being uncomfortable. It's what the world wants. So the, let me tell you, if you have been the target of neglect or violation of the community, or if you end up in a very bad situation in life, and later on, don't mean we're other people, listen, they, knew, they know very well what they did to you. They know it. That's why they avoid you, or that's why they try to blame it all on you, because they know very well what they've done. They don't want to be confronted with what they've done, so that's why they put it all on you. That's why you want to come up with a founding uh, story to make sure the community is built out. And don't get me wrong, scapegoating tends to fail. Be happy with that. Some of you survive scapegoating because it fails. If scapegoating is successful, you either end up damaged for life or you end up uh, dead. Okay? And it happened to a lot of people. Well, that's how fallen mankind operates. They don't obey the Father by participating fully in life. They just want to build out with ease. 
and you get this is at the expense of others. And they want to just and use myths to justify why they have a right to do that. Okay, one question. If I sell, let's say it's a 1500 and Brazil is almost empty from humans, it's mainly animals and forests down there. And there are a few Indians living there. Let's say I go there and I, and I say now, I don't want any of you Indians to come to this beach over here. This beach is mine. If you come, you need to pay me. You think that those names going to think, huh, who are you? Where do you come from? We don't understand your language. What do you say? Oh, you, you say we're not allowed to come to this beach anymore. A beach we've come, we've been coming here for generations. You are not even born here. You're born across the ocean. Now you claim this beach is yours and we have to pay you to come here? If, if the names say, get the hell out of here, they will kick me out of the beach. But what if I have a gun? And I have bullets that can kill them. Now, because I have a gun, they may consider what I'm saying and give, uh, and give more into it. If I have a group of people with guns with me, absolutely, they'll, they'll just stay away. And now, it's private property. Nobody can come because if they come, it's trespassing. So private property and trespassing, they don't exist. Those are things we make up because, listen, all of you were born as a little baby. You were conceived in your mother's womb. You were, you were born as a little baby. Your body grow, you became an adult, and later your body will expire, you'll die. That happens to all of us. And Jesus will come back, and the Lord Jesus will have to resurrect you. Okay? So none of us own anything on the earth. Everything you have, whether it's the clothes you have, or the car you're driving, or the house you live in, are just possessions you have for now. And those possessions are conditional and temporary. None of us own anything. Not even your own body, because it will expire. So how come a creature who just has been around for only a few decades now can say, I own this piece of the earth and you need my permission or else I have a right to shoot you or harm me for being here? What do you say? Well, you know, Americans love the idea of private property, 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 property. It's an obsession with them. First of all, property and trespass does not exist. We make those things up. Property is a claim. Trespass is we not give in to your claim. Well, anyone can come up with a claim. Anyone can come up with a claim. The thing is, some claims are backed up with violence. And that's why the claim is backed up by organized violence. We to recognize them because it's organized violence defending the claim. But to remove the organized violence and just an empty claim. You follow me? So, human beings have empty claims that they want to solidify in, out there. And they do this by using tricks and violence. But now, they want to just, they want an excuse to justify their violence. That's why you have founding myths of nations, and they also, you also have founding myths in communities. And this one I want to explain to you. A founding myth, whether it's from a nation or just a local community, can only work if the victim or scapegoats uh, appears guilty. They have to convince themselves that the victim is really to blame for what they are doing with the victim. Oh, he trespassed my property, so I shot him because uh, I, I, I felt threatened. Uh, okay, there are police officers coming on your property time to time. Why don't you shoot them? Because you feel threatened. Oh, no, because if you shoot a police officer on your property, they come and put you in prison. Oh, this other individual over there, are oh, you come up with a bullshit story? Oh, he tried to rob me or whatever, and likely will believe you because, by the way, he's dead, so he can't talk for himself anymore. So, Human beings in a fallen state, they have empty claims, they want to solidify out there, and they use violence and tricks to get it done. But then they want to, they want to be left alone for being challenged. That's why they come up with founding myths to just to, in hope for you, for you to think they're justifying what they're doing. But the moment you see through the nonsense, you realize they're not justifying what they're doing, guess what? They lose their psychic grip over you. And that's why the world is upset with respect, respect, respect. They insist on you to validate their final claims over you. Because the moment you don't believe those final claims anymore, they'll have a hard time enforcing them on you. Simple as that. Look, that's the thing. The community knows very well what they did. That's why they hold on to myths like that. So that you think they're good quality people. Because if you would accept them, realize they're not. So stop acting like people 
were clueless. Some people are clueless that exists. Some people are clueless. Most of them are not. Most of them just collaborate because they want ease. The only time they admit things when they have no other option or when they're caught red-handed. Amen? So, is it clear to you now why society holds on to myths so much? Is it clear on to you? Let me know in the live chat. So, that is why true believers walk in power are never promoted by the world. Because the world is based on, is based on, is based on ritual murder. That's what the world is based upon. Society is based on group homicide. This, this is what society is based upon. Where the homicide is literally people slamming you into death or shooting you or they just neglect you financially and, and homeless and dying. This happens in New York. Just, just for you, if you know, in New York was this homeless guy that was killed, so-called out of defense, and later found out nothing was true. There was a failed ritual. If that ritual worked, it would have been a founding murder to boost the uh, reputation of New York. Yay, we have good citizens that intervene when people are in danger. No, 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 the ritual failed, thank God. So understand, society runs based on murder blood rituals that are conducted periodically. So if you want to be part of society, you are part of the ritual murder and you're part of the ritual victimization too. So you can't say, oh, I'm an innocent victim, or I have no idea, or whatever. You're part of something in which they show you that it's, a, it's satanic. So if you insist being part of it, you participate in a Satanism. Now, you're not a Satanist, but you participate in a Satanism. So to participate in a Satanism, whether you're a Satanist or not, means you're blameworthy, and when things backfire and it falls on you, nobody should have uh, pity, no sympathy for you, because you were perfectly fine with it happening to anyone else, so just you got your ease. It's all what happens to you, and that was the problem. Mm -hmm. So that's why we shouldn't be unequally yoked with the world. Simple as that. Yes. Just like, um, let me highlight over here. Just like the individual said, they hate believers for our safety. Yes. Believers that obey Christ, they're safe. And because we're safe, we can't be sabotaged, nor blackmailed, nor killed. If we walk in the power. If you have believers who are on the labor, so operating in darkness, well, those believers, you can't take them out if you make enough effort. But the believer fully walk in power, you cannot kill them. You cannot sabotage them, blackmail them. You only hinder them. So, so that's why the Bible says it works against the saints. A saint is a believer fully walk in power. Once you're a saint, you're a saint forever. The world is not at war with believers in general, they're at war with the saints. So once you cross the Jordan and you turn into a saint, you have war against you till the day you're, you're out of here. Because the world world's at war with the saints. They try to say to train and exhaust the saints. Why? Because the saints are the ones who are able to conquer the world and put the precautions on them successfully. Saints are the ones capable to deal with the world's nonsense without using violence. And we, we can do it successfully. That's why the world is against the saints. Amen? All right. So, that was the topic of uh, uh, this live stream. Are there any questions about this topic? Please let me know in the live chat. Let me know. God is good. Mm -hmm. When the scapegoat fails, the, com the community begins to di disintegrate and collapse. That's what happens. That's why they always insist on having scapegoats. 
When the Bishop asks, well, Jah removes things before judgment on the community, listen, when judgment happens right now, in here and now on the community, the saints already out. Because saints already moved on. That's what goes on with saints. Okay? So the saints already out when the judgment hits. Amen? Any other questions? Let me know, please. Let's see if I miss anyone over here. All right, I'll just wait for one more minute. If not, we'll start the live stream. And if all of you would have been here, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. They get any other question over here? So let me check over here for just for sure. All right. Well, that's it for now. Keep on the dream of Christ. Be at peace and see you next live stream. And remember, Christ alone brings long-term solutions. All right? Not society. Don't participate in scapegoating. Uh, be at peace. Yes, anthropology just give insight on such topics. Check Renee Girard.